Welcome. We're glad you're here. And if you weren't here, you'd be getting stuck by a cactus, so you should be glad you're here too. All right. What else? Let me. Cool. Hey, you're welcome again. And we're so glad you're here. Uh, teachings are Sunday school. I'm still teaching 1 John chapter 2, combating false teachers. Michael's teaching Ephesians. John's teaching the youth, but he's out of town. But Lord, I want to know you. Sunday evening, I begin a new section from Acts 18, from Judaism to Jesus, about the struggle for uh, the early church to leave Judaism behind. And then Wednesday evening, that's today. I'm teaching the Lordship of Christ. Sunday morning, I start a new section called... Now that's Sunday night. Uh, Sunday. Sunday morning. I just wrote it on a piece of paper. Ah, see? He's the light of the world. Yeah, the box. This month's missionaries are the Hansons, Beth and Hal, Hal and Beth. In Thailand. You know, Hal's not doing too well. He put some uh, prostate issues. Yeah. In fact, I think he's coming to the States for treatment. So. Oh, and the, the, t the thank you for the church ministry for this month is Sunday school teacher. Thank you, Michael, for teaching Sunday school. Betsy's a Sunday school teacher. Who else is a Sunday school teacher? Mike Cox is a Sunday school teacher. Yeah, Michael's a Sunday school teacher. Betsy, yeah. All right, what, what's next? Thank you, Mom. Your giving is between you and the Lord. There's a box back there for that. Sunday night, we're going to Vindy's so we can wait in line. And then the men's breakfast, ooh, already. 13 July, Mike. I have to see what's going on. Hospitality will meet on the 14th. Elders meet on the 15th. And then Awana helpers are needed. Da 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 da. Da, 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 it's almost time. Da, 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 da. Can you feel it? July 21st is the first Awana meeting. Be there or be square. And then Mr. Fish and Ms. Thony request the honor of your presence at their covenant marriage ceremony on the 24th at 3 p.m. at First Baptist, and you can RSVP to Karen Pike. All right, there's Karen. All right. Is that it? That's it? Yes, Karen. I just want to point out that we're going for school supplies with them, so we're at Walmart. There you go. For a little while. But we need we two boxes full. Awanas and OCC. Yeah. We, should do a, we should do a thing on that Sunday morning. Oh. Okay. No, oh, we'll let Karen talk about it. That'll work. Oh, I gave her at least 45 seconds. You know how fast these are. They're so guarded of their time. Is that it? Any other announcements? No? Okay. How about, how about your prayer request today? Hey, I heard Ray Vidal doesn't have any cancer. Again. Amen. He texted me today. I texted him back. I said, oh, what a relief. And then I'm thinking, well, he must really be relieved. 
<laughs> but yeah, he's doing, uh, so that's good news. You know, I don't think they think, what do you think, Gene? That's pretty good news, isn't it? All right, other prayer praises or requests? Yeah, Ma. My sister Tila. First thing Tila needs is Jesus. So then the other things might get worked out. <laughs> she needs Jesus first. All the way over in Texas. God is, God is, uh, God over Texas too, so he can find the other way. Other prayer requests? Yeah, Renee. Go ahead, Renee. You're Renee. That's Jennifer. Go ahead, Renee. Yes. Small world, huh? John Randall. I met John Randall's in Clover many years ago. John was very, uh, very, uh, very well-known sports motivational speaker. He used to go to uh, Texas. Well, he he started a ministry at Texas Tech, and he used to talk to. UT, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, all their football teams. He was in high demand. And we're going to bring his wife over here to do a woman's conference, not this fall, but the next year. And she's a, she's a special lady. Jennifer? Your brother getting help for Al? Okay, is he or... Where does he live? Does he? Okay. okay. Well, God knows all about that. So. Amen. What's his name? Jeremiah. All right. Pray for Jeremiah. And the kids are going to camp. Pray for the camp. John's mother, John Peralta's mother, has swollen lymph nodes that are swollen to the point of giving her migraine headache. So pray they figure out what's going on there. Others? Why don't, where do I know him from? I know him. I know his name. There you go. That's where I know him. Right. I'm tired of cancer. All right, anybody else? Prayer requests? Anybody? Nobody? Amen. There you go. Yeah, they've been sitting right over there. Usually I see them over there. Anybody else? stand. Brother Mike, will you pray for us, please? Tenth lesson in, uh, under the topic of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and we 
we've been doing character studies. We looked at uh, the rich young ruler, Zacchaeus, and as we were finishing up last week, I had just begun to speak about Judas. Now, I made this statement. It's in your outline. Judas is a prime example of a professing believer who fell into absolute apostasy. I think when Judas gave up everything and began to follow Christ, I think he thought he was a believer. Is that a safe assumption? Do you think? Okay. He followed Jesus for three years with the other disciples. He appeared as they appeared. I would imagine that he felt himself, as I said, as a believer. At least initially he did. I don't think he joined Christ with the intention of betraying Christ. Somewhere along the line, I guess he became greedy. Uh, but I don't think that was his motive to start with. He was a, we know he was a zealot, and thus he was looking for someone that would overthrow the Romans, and he thought Christ would do that. Matthew 8.20 implies that Jesus and his disciples had very little mat- things of material value. All these men gave up everything they had to follow Christ, and I, I think Judas shared the hope of Christ's kingdom And he likely believed that Jesus was Messiah. He'd left everything behind. And so I I say this, and I think we started to get, we started to think. I said this in today's modern terminology that I worry so much about. In today's church vernacular that I worry so much about. I think we could say that Judas, Judas had accepted Christ. In your outline, the word is accepted. And so I'm going to delve deeper into that topic tonight. But for three years, Judas occupied himself with Christ. He saw the miracles. He heard his words. He participated in the ministry. And during that entire time, we never have any note of anyone questioning his faith. No one suspected that he was a man who would betray Jesus. Yet it seems as the others were growing into apostles, Judas was becoming a tool of Satan. So was his faith real? Turn to John 13, 10 and 11. You're going to have to help me. You're going to have to read some of this for me. John 13, 10 and 11. When you get there, somebody read it, please. And what does that mean? Remember, we talked about that. Jesus said, he tells them that if, if you're washed, uh, what, do, what, we, what do we mean by being washed? We've discussed that before. He, was, he is washed. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. Why? If you're bathed, why do you need only to wash your feet? But is completely clean. What does that mean? It means you've been saved. You are bathed, but do you sin? And when you do, what do you do? You repent. That's washing of your feet. Okay? I think that we we need to know that. And then it says in verse 11, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Speaking of Judas, Jesus knew Judas wasn't saved. He wasn't clean. He was not, or he was unregenerate, if you will. He had a heart that was gradually, evidently being hardened over time. 
that would make him into a man who would end up selling his savior for a fistful of coins. He became a man, according to uh, John 13, 27, he became a man that Satan, how's it worded? What does it say? 13, 27? Sa now after the peace, Satan entered him. Satan entered him. Yep. So it would seem that John was personally possessed by Satan. And uh, it's interesting to note that, you know, Judas was there until the very, very, very end. And on the night that he betrayed his Lord, he was seated right next to Jesus at the Last Supper. He let the Lord wash his feet. And then, after that, he finally left and made his way to get his 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus knew this all the time. John 13, 18. Christ said he knew that the one that would eat bread with him and lift up his heel against him. And Jesus, is, is, uh, he, he begins uh, some Old Testament quotations. If you look in Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, there's a, the, this is a pretty good picture of who uh, Judas is. Psalm 55, 12 through 14. If you get there before me, just read it. imagine how Jesus felt? This guy was one of his inner circle, one of his best friends. And uh, that's a good picture. Those words are good. Good. It gives us a good picture of how Jesus felt about Judas. Uh, close, very close to his Savior, but a very, very long way away from salvation. And I think that's a good, that's a good thing for us to see because I think the life of Ju Ju Judas can be a, a warning to us about, about not casually professing knowledge of Christ. I'm sure Judas would say, I know Jesus. I'm sure he would have. But did he know Jesus? Not with his heart. His life, uh, you know, his life, is not, it's, not, it's not enough to simply know Jesus. It's not enough to just respond to Christ positively. You have to respond to Christ wholeheartedly. Because it's important to understand the risk. And the risk is being lost and damned forever. And Judas would seem to be a very good friend of Christ, but he never really came to know Christ. So G Judas was the one who betrayed Christ, and it's not as if, did Christ ever give Judas a chance to repent? In your outline, the word is repent. All the time, every day. Do you think G Judas heard the gospel? All the time, every day. How many different circumstances, how many different situations was he in where he could see the divinity of Jesus Christ, the deity of Christ. So in, in this narrative in John 13, uh, we see these dramatic uh, situations taking place. In 1321, uh, there's a dramatic moment when uh, Jesus' spirit becomes troubled. And he tells everybody at the Last Supper that there is one there that's going to betray him. 
Imagine how the other guys felt. They must have been shocked. But Judas is sitting there, isn't he? <laughs> Why do you think Jesus was troubled? I asked you this last week. Why was he troubled? Was, was it because he loved Judas and Judas didn't love him? Maybe. Was it because Jesus hates sin? Maybe. Maybe because the incarnation of sin, Judas was sitting next to him? Maybe because of the, hip the hypocrisy, the imminent betrayal? Maybe because the Lord realized that Judas was the realization of sin that he himself would end up bearing on the cross on the very next day? I'm not sure about all of that, but I personally believe that what troubled Jesus the most, and I said this last time, was that this man was about to, or this man had made a decision that was going to condemn him to hell forever. In your outline, the word is perish. He would perish. Matthew 26, 22 says, All the disciples asked, Surely not I, Lord. Even Judas asked that question. He kept on playing his part. And the Lord's reply was, You have said it yourself. And that told Jesus, Judas that Jesus knew exactly who it was that was going to betray him. So the other, the other disciples show this. Uh, they're kind of perplexed by the whole situation. But has Jesus, do you think Jesus ever treated Judas any different than anybody else? There's no indication that he ever did. Judas had been just as loved as the others. And he was probably just as rebuked as much as the others were. But I don't think he was seen as a black sheep. If he was seen, if he had been treated differently, then probably one of the other disciples would have said, when Jesus said, well, somebody's going to betray me, one of the other guys would have said, it must be Judas, man. Now, Judas is a bad guy. But did they trust Judas? Yeah, he kept the money. They let him keep the money. So usually that means that they trust you. So really, the, I want to contrast two of the central figures here. We know we keep doing this uh, studies. Yeah, Michael? Yeah, I think he was already beginning to feel remorseful. I think he was already understanding. Uh, and I think, I, one thing, I don't think Judas wanted to happen. He didn't want anything to happen in front of him. No, no, he didn't. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. So I want to contrast these two figures here. I want to look at Judas and John. Because the hatred that was in Judas is contrasted with the, in your outline the word is, with the love that was in John. And John also reclined at the table next to Jesus. Uh, you know, they, they kind of half reclined on the floor. They would uh, lean up on their left elbow and uh, use their right hand to eat. So the John would have been positioned where his head would have been at the uh, chest level of Christ. And when he would turn to speak to Christ, he would be, uh, the Lord's head would be right here, right above him. And uh, John loved to be close to Jesus. It's a very... Uh, the, this, this picture is very emblematic, very indicative of the way John liked to be physically close to Jesus. And uh, in verses 24 and 25 here in John 13, Peter singles to John to ask Jesus who, who it is that's going to betray him. Let me look at that real quick. 
it says, uh, Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' bread, he said to him, Lord, Lord, who is it? And then Jesus, he tells them who it is, but they, you know, there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of times where the apostles are kind of out to lunch. The disciples are kind of, they don't really understand what Jesus is telling them a lot. So John 13 tells us of the identification of the betrayer, but this is, there, there's much more than that here in this narrative. This can't be seen just as an answer to the question. It also has to be seen, here's another time where Jesus is appealing to, to Judas. Jesus gives, who gets, who gets fed first? Judas. Why? Because that means he's the, he's the guest of honor. He's the honored guest. All, the honored guest would always get fed first. So the picture is Christ has already washed his feet, and now he's treating him as the honored guest. And wouldn't you think, with all of that, that Judas' heart would be ready to break? But it's hard to break a hard heart. You outline the word is hard. And you know, after the morsel of bread, the final rejection takes place as Satan enters Judas, and Satan has full uh, control. Uh, let me say this too, though. Satan has full control, but you know what? Judas agrees with him 100%. That's why Satan has full control. Judas has rejected every opportunity from a loving Christ that he knew so, so very well. And really, this is, it is at this point that, in my mind at least, uh, the day of salvation has probably expired for Judas. It would seem that his doom is sealed and Jesus has had enough, so it, it, it would seem that Jesus, Jesus is now done with Judas, and all he wants for Judas to do now is to leave. So he tells him to do his do, deed quickly, and Jesus, you know, Jesus, uh, it's almost like Jesus just wants to get uh, that person out of there. He doesn't want that stain to be there as he spends his last hours with his other disciples. Still, it would seem that probably uh, maybe Peter and John have, are starting to figure it out if you look at verse, but no one in the table knew, verse 28, for no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. What you do, do quickly. Jesus told uh, Judas at the end of 27, but no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, uh, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that they should give something to the poor. So Judas, having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. I like the way John adds that. It was night. So the total deception now is set, and the man is possessed by Satan, yet the, and yet uh, the others can't detect it. And somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, Judas has become a master deceiver. In your outline, the words are master deceiver. And as John said, he goes off into the night. It's night, it's dark outside because the sun has gone down and it's dark outside. It's dark outside physically, and it's dark outside spiritually. In your outline, the word is spiritually. Here's Judas, a man who had been given the greatest spiritual advantages afforded any man, and yet he had squandered that wonderful opportunity just to fulfill his true passion. Why? 
Well, because his faith was never a, a genuine, in your outline the word is genuine faith. He had once responded to the call of Jesus Christ in an affirmative way, had he not? In today's vernacular, you could say he came forward. But he never let Jesus into his heart and his life was lived with the unclouded light of Jesus standing right with him. And yet, Look how his life ends up in despair. And that's really the ending for all that live their life without knowing Jesus Christ. So the fi final physical contact that happens between Jesus and Judas that Michael was speaking of is a kiss. A kiss of death. For who? It's for Judas. It's a kiss of, kiss of death for Judas. That same night in the garden, Jesus has gone to pray, and uh, this is the premeditated signal that has been determined that they will use to identify Jesus. You know, in the society at that time, uh, slaves would kiss their master's feet. If you went to seek uh, mercy from a monarch, you might kiss their feet, beg for forgiveness. If somebody important was around, you might kiss the, the hem of their garment to express your reverence for them. A student would kiss the hand of their teacher. Can you imagine that today? <laughs> But an embrace with a kiss on the cheek was considered to be a sign of close, close affection, one of love and intimacy. It was a gesture reserved for the very closest of friends. The kiss of Judas was a despicable act in that it feigned affection and was really just an act of betrayal. And having had to endure that act, Matthew 26, 50 says, Jesus told Judas, friend, do what you have come for. When you look at the Greek manuscripts that pertain to that, what it really says is, uh, it kind of says, uh, do, do what you've got to do, Okay? Do what you've got to do. So, what were the response of those other disciples that were there with Jesus? Ju Judas has betrayed him. What did the other disciples do when they come to take Jesus? Matthew says all the disciples left him and fled. Now, Jesus has already predicted that, hasn't he? Matthew 26, 31. And what did Peter do, ultimately? He would deny him three times. So did their act differ from the act of Judas? Yeah. First of all, they had a greatly different motivation. The disciples were scared. They were under the pressure of that particular moment, while Ju Judas... He was just a calculated uh, traitor. He planned what he was going to do. The disciples failed when they were confronted with, by this great trial, but Judas pursued an act of treason caused by his own motivations. And I don't think we quite understand all of his motivations. I'm sure we understand some of them. The disciples would ultimately, though, turn from their sinful way and humbly accept Jesus' forgiveness. But Judas never asked for forgiveness. Judas only, uh, the only thing that the word says is that he felt remorseful about his reactions or his actions. He never repented of his actions. And he confirmed his remorse by his act of suicide. The disciples failed temporarily. 
Judas had a totally depraved soul and failed for an eternity. I have never, we have never, said that the mark of a true disciple is a, in your outline, the word is sinless life. But rather when we do, in the outline the word is sin, we return to our Savior to receive his forgiveness and cleansing. A true disciple never turns away completely, unlike a false disciple. When we are confronted with our sin, we only have one response, and that is to turn to Christ. So really Judas is a picture child a poster child for false discipleship. Notice the characteristics of his hypocrisy. First of all, he loved temporal gains more than eternal riches. He wanted glory. He wanted success. He wanted earthly treasures. And maybe he was disappointed. Maybe he was disappointed that Christ didn't meet his messiahship expectations. Maybe he thought he should have a position of importance in Christ's earthly ministry. But one thing that we know is that false disciples always end up showing their true colors. They're like that seed that springs up in the rocky soil. What happens? It grows for a while flourishes, and then it just dies. That's a picture of a false disciple. Okay? It ends up withering and dying. That's why I always say the only true barometer of a true believer is to per their perseverance to the end. False disciples will follow Christ for a season, but eventually they'll sell him out for whatever it is that they desire. Their selfish desires, their money, prestige, power, etc., etc. Secondly, in Judas, we see a man who was marked by deceit. His faith was only a masquerade. And false disciples are all always masters of subtle deception. They're very adept at deluding other people. They pretend to love while giving kisses of deceit. And then finally, Judas, as with all fights, false disciples, was in it for what he could get, what he could receive is the word in your outline, receive. These are people that are satisfied with a clear conscience, a peace of mind, a good reputation, spiritual self-satisfaction. Some will profess, profess Christ because it's good for their business. They think it'll be good for their health or their wealth or their prosperity. But eventually, with those type of people, their half-hearted faith will turn to hard-hearted unbelief. And I have a fear that like Judas, there are many such people in the contemporary church. They're friendly with Jesus. They've hung around with him for a long time. They look like disciples. They talk like disciples. But they're not committed to Christ.